Happy Sunday, faith community. Happy Sunday. Yeah, right? It's a beautiful, beautiful autumn day. You get to watch a little football and get to worship together. Of course, it's a happy Sunday. Hey, we're, we're finishing up a series on work. We're going to talk about work. At some point, you're going to talk about the life force of the free market system, competition. Right? How do we as Christians exhibit our faith in a world and in a business world, wherever that competition is at, right at the core of what we do? Because sometimes competition is fun. If you go to the website, heftycostlessthanglad.com, you would see their latest campaign, Talking Trash Bags. Talking Trash Bags that have a series of statements on them, things like, I'm so trashy, or feeling like garbage today, or hashtag goals, or it's, on the in, it's what's on the inside that counts. Hefty's just grabbing the idea, we do trash. And we do trash cheaper than Glad does trash, right? Have a little fun while you're putting it out. Sometimes competition is really fun. Sometimes it's a little less fun. In 1919, two brothers were in the family shoe business, the Dassler family shoe business. Okay, and they had a major falling out because these two brothers just never got along, and then there was a tipping point for the two of them that just collapsed their relationship, and they went their own separate ways with the shoe business. One brother went to the south of the river that separated this German town, and he established Adidas, or, as Americans would say, Adidas. His brother went to the north of the town of the river and established Puma. So Puma and Adidas were established by two different brothers. As these businesses grew, they just kind of took over the whole town. It got to a point where literally someone in every family in the community worked at one of the two companies. But the sort of the hatred between the two brothers kind of filtered its way down through the companies. It became understood. In this community, if you were a Catholic, you worked for Adidas. If you were a Protestant, you worked for Puma. It became known literally as the town of bent necks. That was their reputation. Because if you walked into a store, they looked down at your shoes. And if you weren't wearing the correct shoes, they politely suggested you should go across the river to the other butcher shop, to the other bakery. Divided the whole town. It got into their business practices. In 1968, for the Olympics, an Adidas executive bribed officials to hold all of Puma's uh, materials at the dock, holding it hostage to a 30% tariff. It even got to the point when one of the executives of Adidas bribed the police to arrest a Puma executive. The police did it. They pulled up alongside him at night in a van, grabbed him, threw him in the van, and he disappeared for two days. It took the American embassy to intercede to find out why he had been arrested and to release him. I mean, this, this sort of like vicious business practice separated the, uh, not just the company, but the whole communities, even families. When the two brothers died, they had to bury the two brothers at opposite ends of the town cemetery. It took 60 years to heal the community. When people who were not related to the family had eventually bought both companies, they held a community-wide soccer match and required that the teams would be composed of employees from both companies so they'd have to play nice together. Sometimes competition is fun. It's a little trashy. Sometimes competition divides relationships in whole communities. How do we as Christians live out our faith? If we're supposed to be the same at home, at work, as we are at church, how do we live out our faith in our work environment? We know that one of the distinguishing characteristics of Christians follows one of the core commands of Jesus. Jesus said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second great command is to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Following Jesus Christ boils down to loving God and loving people. How do we do that? So this is what we're going to talk about today. How do I do that with my competitors? How do I do that with colleagues in my same company? How do I do it with my teammates in my business? And we're going to look at dead kings. We're going to look at literal backstabbing. And we're going to look at warriors on a water run. To do that, I should pray. God, I want to thank you for this opportunity this morning to just spread your word. God, to pull out of this ancient document that I believe has been inspired by you. It's life is in it because you're in this Bible. As I speak this morning, may you fill the life that's in the Bible. May you take it and you fill this room. 
May your presence be real. May you use me in a way that goes above and beyond myself. Speak, God. I'm offering myself to you. Speak to the heart of every person in this room, Lord. I love you. Amen. We've been looking at David, kind of as like a, a little case study in business practices. So we take another look at David this week and three little stories from his life. The first one comes, there's a point in a, in a major war. David is in exile. He's on the run because the king Saul, out of jealousy and competition, was trying to kill David. Well, in this major battle, Saul dies. The current king and his son, the prince, die in battle. This opens up a vacuum of leadership for Israel. David's following has been growing. His reputation has been growing. His strength as a leader has been increasing daily, weekly, annually. I mean, people love him, follow him. This is a vacuum of leadership that David could easily step into. And when the king falls, remember now, David is in exile because this king who had taken him into his house, whom David had loved and tried to serve, they was seeking to kill him. So David has this opportunity at the death of Saul to step in and to take over and to start to lead. Well, look at how David responds to the news of Saul's death. In lament, David ripped his clothes to ribbons. All the men with him did the same. They wept and fasted the rest of the day, grieving the death of Saul and his son Jonathan and the army of God and the nation of Israel, victims fallen in battle. David responds with compassion. David could have rejoiced at the death of this political leader who had persecuted him, made horrible decisions, and was leading Israel into terrible directions. He didn't, though. He chose to respect the position, even if he couldn't respect the person, because he looked at the moment, and he said, how can I rejoice when people have died? How can I rejoice when families are missing family members? How can I rejoice when a nation is without a leader and is rudderless at this time? Even though he could see the death of someone who sought his life, and others could say, David, it's your time to take the move and to rejoice, David took a step back and showed compassion for somebody who had tried to bring harm to his life. Even went on, David is known for writing songs and, and poems to lament the death of different people. He wrote one and he said this, How beloved and gracious was Saul and Jonathan. They were together in life and death. They were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. A woman of Israel, weep for Saul, for he dressed you in luxurious scarlet clothing and garments decorated with gold. Oh, how the mighty heroes have fallen in battle. Jonathan lies dead on the hills. Saul didn't have a great character. Saul is known as a weak leader. He was the guy who compromised his principles and his practices and the direction to try to please other people. He had violent tendencies and a jealous nature that was directed at David. So David stood back and asked, what in the very least could I comment on to kind of bring some sort of respect to David and Jonathan, Saul and Jonathan in their deaths? And he just commented on they were heroes in battle, that they had an economic benefit to the nation. He looked for honesty in how he could express something respectable about the two of them. Because David knew a principle that Jesus would emphasize centuries later when Jesus would say, you've heard the law that says love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you're kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But, if you, but you are to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus reminds us that love distinguishes his followers from everyone else on the planet. Even in the way we respond to our enemies, people who are seeking our demise, undermining our reputation, trying to take away from our jobs, our careers, our families. And because Jesus is such a leader of integrity, he practices what he preaches, literally. He gave this teaching, and then we see in the story of his life, the gospel is hanging from a cross where every breath was an expression of agony. Jesus forgave the people who put him on the cross 
and prayed for them as they stood at the base of the cross, mocking him in his death. He put this into practice because Jesus knew that love was the defining characteristic of the Father and sought to be loving through his whole life, even into his death. And Jesus calls us to weave together our faith into our families, into our neighborhoods, into our businesses and workplace, as well as into our church. He calls us to love, to love in a way that sets us apart from those around us. What if Jesus was speaking in a TED conference, a TED business conference? What if he said this as just a variation of what he'd been teaching in other contexts? You've been taught love your company and hate your competitor. I say love your competitors. Pray for those who fight against you in the market. Because in that way, you'll be acting as two children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his solar energy to every company. He sends natural resources to them, even the ones you don't like. If you love only your company, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt business people do that much. If you're kind only to your colleagues, how are you different from anyone else? People who aren't Christian do that. But you are to be consistent everywhere, work, home, and church, even as your Father in heaven is consistent. What would that do to your workplace? How would that change your environment? How would that change your relationship with people if you began to treat the competitor with love? Now, I'm not saying that you go out there and not having a warm, fuzzy barbecue with your competitors. But I'm talking about some consideration of things, like when your competitor, you know when an executive falls, finally when they get revealed and their practices come out and they fall and they collapse, we want to we wanna cheer, but you know that there's a family connected to that executive who's living now in shame. When a company collapses and their employees are lost without a job, you know that there are people now who are struggling to pay the bills, to pay their mortgage, to pay their utility. They might have children in college. The demise of a competitor isn't something we have to celebrate. We can, with compassion, express respect to them. Even, when, even if it's difficult to respect a company or to a corporate leader, there's going to be something about that position, even if it's not the person that you could say in terms of respect, to express love for those who are suffering from the decisions of others, from the demise and loss of their workplace and of their income, of the impact onto their families. So we can stand out with love in a world that doesn't see this type of love. Because expressing our faith in the workplace means we respect our competitors. But it's not always a tension between companies. Sometimes it's within companies, right? Between divisions and departments and within colleagues within the same company. David had an experience like this. So after Saul and uh, Jonathan died, there was a bit of a civil war that took place. As David rose in prominence in the south of the nation... Saul's son, Ishbosheth, grew and uh, took over a position of leadership in the northern side of the country. And for years, there was a war between the two. The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. David grew stronger and stronger. The house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. So in this competition between these two people in the same nation, we're seeing a divide that affected the whole nation. David is growing in strength as a political leader while Ishbosheth is diminishing. They each had what would be our, we would call him a commander of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, somebody who led the whole military. Ishbosheth had a man named Abner, and David had a man named Joab. Well, Ishbosheth and Abner, the leader of this country and the commander of his military forces, have a falling out. And Abner steps back and realizes that the character flaws of the father are evident in the son. And he seems that he hits a place he realizes this is just not going to be a good leader for the nation. And he reaches out to David. And he says to David, whose land is it? Make an agreement with me and I will help you bring all Israel over to you. Good, says David. I'll make an agreement with you. David doesn't have to do this. You got to remember, David is growing in strength. Eventually, he could take the whole thing himself. But he pulls back and he asks himself the question, what's the greater good here than this rivalry between the two of us? What's the greater good that we can achieve by working together rather than competing against one another? And so he crosses the line with Abner and he brings Abner over and they, they actually broker a deal to try to bring healing to the whole nation. They ask themselves the question, what's better for the whole than for the person? 
and they want to heal the nation. Struggle is that Joab, which is David's commander-in-chief, doesn't feel the same way as David does. There is, a, there is a hatred, a desire for revenge that Joab has harbored inside of his soul towards Abner. He can't believe that David would broker a deal with this guy. He can't get past his bitterness and his anger towards something that Abner had done in the past. He can't see the, better, the higher good that could take place in this moment. And so he cre- orchestrates a situation with Abner where he literally stabs him in the back, or maybe in the belly and kills him, creates chaos. And David, who just said, well, that didn't work, and now here's a nation without its military leader, now's the time for me to move in, pulls back again and asks what the greater good is. And David pulls back, and he calls out Joab in front of everybody for doing something that was wrong. He goes into mourning for the loss of Joab, and requires that everyone follows his example in showing respect to this great leader. And again, the irony in the situation is that Abner was actually Saul's cousin. That throughout the story of David, Abner and David were constantly competing against one another. Embarrassing, calling them out, having literal wars and battles, fighting against one another. But David could see a higher good that could happen if they could, dis- if they could just dissolve the rivalry to do something that's better for everyone. They could both recognize what was better. This is like a vacancy in the president's position of a company, and now you have two senior execs who are fighting for the position, and they're creating battle lines that are dividing the whole company. Or it's like, it's like the head of manufacturing who's consistently undermining engineering's design. Or maybe it's more like sales that are mocking mocking the marketing campaign. It could be older employees in a company, right, who are holding back wisdom to watch the younger employees fall and embarrass themselves. Or the younger employees who are holding back new technological advances or approaches from older employees to make them look irrelevant and obsolete. It's these relationships we have within a company where colleagues who are supposed to be working together towards the same goal in the company are actually undermining each other stabbing each other in the back, gossiping and slandering towards one another, trying to undermine our reputation. But the truth is, like, the truth is, a company is like a community, right? It's like a community, and they thrive best when everyone acts like a good neighbor, not like two opposing forces on a football field. Think of what Jesus said. We just talked about this morning already. The second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And what's a neighbor? A neighbor is someone who lives in your community. And in a good community, neighbors work for the benefit of all so that everyone prospers. And what if a company was like that? What if a company was like a seri- just like a relationship of good neighbors, colleagues that were working together to benefit one another for the greater good of the whole company so that everyone benefits? Instead of a nation, instead of a, a community of neighbors at war with one another, what if there were a community of neighbors that were treating one another with love and respect? How do you respect a, a colleague? It starts by putting aside your rivalries. It starts by putting aside your agenda for your personal benefit as opposed to the good of the whole company. It starts when you whether it's you're working with somebody in a small business or a large business, it begins when you start asking yourself questions like this. Am I really the best person for the promotion? Why do I want it? What is it that I want to gain? Is it all for personal reasons? Or do I really think that being in that position will make the company a better company? What if loving your neighbor calls you to pull back and say, Is my plan that I'm trying to orchestrate a plan to undermine another division, another department, another person? Or is it really for the benefit of the whole company? What am I trying to do here with my actions? How does holding on to this grudge for this long really make me a better person? How do my actions in this company, across the divisions and departments, how, does my, how do my actions reflect God's character? If I'm supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which is the character of God and the very character of the divine God, it includes kindness and goodness. 
How do my actions, how are they kind? And how are they good? What is it about me that wants to succeed at the cost of another person? Why do I do that? Is that really loving? What's driving me to succeed? These are questions that kind of cause us to stop and to pull back and, and to ask ourselves, how can I be kind to my colleagues? But even in, in a company or a business, whatever your profession is, there are teammates that you work with pretty closely on a daily basis. How do you love your teammates? We take a look at what I call a flashback moment in the life of David. You know, a flashback in a movie, so you're kind of living in, a, in this sort of this moment of time, and then a memory comes. A little fuzzy fadeback, whatever, music changes to let you know, characters look younger, that this takes place in the past. Well, there's a flashback moment in the story of David among the, about these warriors who followed David, because David, in his leadership, had a way of drawing the best around him. So David now, this is a period in time before Saul had died, when Saul had been chasing him, and David was hiding out in the mountains and caves. And he's having a, a pretty dark moment, because you can imagine, he's been on the run for a long time. They're always trying to find the resources. He's always trying to meet the needs of those who are following him. He's still trying to do the right thing, and things don't always go his way, and God anointed me king, and here I am in the wilderness. And in this dark, he has this dark moment. He's surrounded by enemies in the valley around him, separated from his hometown of Bethlehem. There's a detachment of enemy, enemy soldiers in that place. And David, in this dark moment, says this. David longed for water and said, oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. This is like, you ever have that time where, as an adult, you, you know, like, being an adult sometimes isn't always fun, right? You know, you, the bills are piling up, or the struggles are increasing, or there's difficulties that have filled your life, and you just reminisce about your past, right? You think about that ice cream shop where you grew up, and how you really loved going there when you were free as a kid, or maybe there was a certain type of soda, or if you're from another region of the country, pop, that you could only buy there, you couldn't get anywhere else. And you reminisce about that place, because it was just an, a simpler time. Well, that's what David is doing. You know, some people over here, three mighty warriors, go back, thank you. So the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. That's a simple statement. I want to tell you what really happened. These three guys overheard David's longing. Because they loved and respected this leader, they slipped out of the caves and they made it past an encampment of enemy soldiers that were right in the valley. They went through and climbed over a mountain range. They went a half a marathon's distance to a small town of Bethlehem that had a detachment of soldiers in it, slipped through the enemy lines there, drew water out of the well that David referenced, went back through the enemies, went back through the mountain ravine, went past the detachment of soldiers that were at, in this area and went into the cave and brought David this water. The distance was roughly a marathon, having to run through enemies, armed enemies. Now, you could imagine that moment for David when he's standing there and they show up with this, his teammates, his colleagues. And so look at what David does. He refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out before the Lord. Now, the first time I saw this, I thought, I don't know that I would do that. These guys have swords. They're probably tired. They're probably hangry, worn out. They fought against enemies. They show up. They go to all this trouble, and David pours out the water. I was thinking, not a brilliant move, right, at first. But listen to how he explains it, and I'm going to tell you a little, explain a little bit from his perspective. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? And David wouldn't drink it. Such were the exploits of the three mighty warriors. In his day and age, that was a sacred experience. David held that, held that um, water bag. He said, it isn't water that's in here, it's loyalty that's in here. In this bag are people who went at the risk of their lives to do something I could never have asked them to do and I wouldn't have expected to happen. Put their lives at risk for me. And David held back and he said, that type of loyalty is really a sacred gift. And the only thing to do with a sacred gift is to give it to God. And that's what he did. He loved his teammates in a pretty broad, pretty powerful moment. Jesus talks about this type of love when he's building his team together, the disciples, and he's preparing them to lead the church. He looks at him and says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Is it remarkable 
that Jesus, on the last night of his life, to the team that he had been prepping to take over and to start the church, he looks at him and says, guys, this is the one thing I really want you to do well. Love each other. Because he had said to them at another point, he goes, you know, everyone will know that you're my disciples by the way that you'll love one another. Later in the same evening, he would say, you know, there's no greater commandment than this is to love one another. Love one another as I have loved you. Jesus just knew that the expression of love was the distinguishing characteristic of his followers. And that applies to your business context, even with your teammates. And now it's interesting, because sometimes I'll talk like this, and people think, well, you're a pastor in a church. You don't work in a company. That's fair enough. Harvard Business Review published an article of a study of 3,200 employees in seven different industries. And you know what they discovered? Employees that work in a company that is distinguished by compassion, caring, and love are actually more committed to their companies, they're more productive and open to accountability, and they're more satisfied with their jobs. They said, they made up a word I can't pronounce, compassionate cultures, which is their way of saying loving cultures, because they knew, they said, we just can't call it a loving culture, because who would consider a business like that, and there's too many connotations around that. You talk about create a loving culture at your business, and you're worried you're going to get reported to HR, right? They said, but what they discovered is that a business environment that is marked by compassion, caring, and love creates a solid team and people committed to the company. And then they gave examples. It's like the boss who says, who literally made a policy within 48 hours of the death of someone's family member, I want to know so I can reach out. Or it's like it's in an environment where the employees can pull vacation time and they can give it as a gift to somebody going through a tragedy so that those people can have more time without sacrificing their salary. It's a company where people go by and they speak words of encouragement and kindness to other people. They give out high fives and they mark off what somebody else did well even if it didn't, doesn't highlight them. I'm talking about creating an environment of love. And this is what Jesus was saying. The way that we love our teammates is a distinguishing characteristic, and it actually benefits everyone. And I get this. This is not typical MBA advice. It'd be hard to find a course, an MBA course on love, right? One that talks about respecting your competitors, being kind to your colleagues, and loving your teammates. You just don't find a lot of talk about that in the business world. But this is the thing. Okay, following Jesus Christ is what makes us unique, and what really makes us unique as followers of Jesus Christ is the love that we weave into our workplace, in our relationships. Whether it's with competitors that we can respect while we're trying to beat them in the, in the free market, whether it's with colleagues that we have to contend against for promotions, or it's teammates that we have to work with on a daily basis. It's the fabric of love and those relationships that distinguishes Jesus' followers from the rest of the world. And now we even have data that that's actually something that can make your business a little bit more successful. You know, this is what I call spiritual maturity. Hearing this information is not enough. Living it is what Jesus calls us to do. Because if you store what you've heard in this room, you go outside into the world around you, and it's just information that you heard on Sunday morning, that doesn't make you more Christian. It make you more spiritually mature than other people. It just means you have more information. Well, Google has more information than you do. That doesn't make it a leader of Christian faith. What makes us distinct is the way we apply information into our relationships of life so that love marks who we are. That's why we've been doing for this. We've been taking this card. And, you know, it, it just helps if everybody holds it. It makes me feel better, right? And we just talked about love, so love me by holding the card, right? Thank you. Thank you. You guys are awesome, right? Just hold on to the card for me, but do more than that. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give you an opportunity to listen to God for a moment. Because you leave this room and what happens? Life. And the things that you heard that were important get washed away by the demands of life. I'm giving you a minute to stop and to breathe and to say, God, what did you say to me? Because I know he pricked your mind. He touched your conscience. He brought a thought to you. Write it down. Say, don't forget it. Take this minute and just breathe and listen to God.
God, what a privilege it is to be here, safe in a place where we can listen to you speak to us, where your spirit can take what is said and speak into our lives in such practical ways. It changes Monday through Saturday. Help us to listen every single day to you so that all of our relationships change and are marked by love. I love you, Father, and I trust you to lead us.